eggs in one basket. You know, Mr. Bigelow's been a general contractor all of his life, and he never depends on one sole source provider. And that brings us to the importance of commercial transportation, not as an alternative to Aries Orion, but at least as a backup. If things don't go according to plan, if Congress cuts the budget, that we don't lose human spaceflight in America, as Patty pointed out. I don't think this president, and I don't think politicians like Senator Nelson and Senator Shelby, who care deeply for human spaceflight, want to preside over the end of America's ability to send their citizens to space. Currently, we see two good options, uh, space exploration technologies, which you'll hear more from, uh, as well as United Launch Alliance, you'll hear from George Sowers next. We believe these are both important options and strongly encourage that we have more than one commercial provider because we don't want to be dependent on SpaceX alone, which is why we're so excited about the positive things we hear regarding ULA and uh, the Atlas V in particular. Now, again, this conference should not be about, you know, the viability of Aries Orion or really a discussion of that. And as some of you know, we had some harsh words for Senator Shelby, and he had some harsh words for commercial. I believe he said that we in commercial are a fantasy. Well, I just showed you the proof. This is video of actual hardware in orbit, and you're going to see more of that as the panel continues. So commercial is not a fantasy, but as we said in the editorial, we have a great deal of respect for Senator Shelby, and we do not begrudge what he's trying to do. He is a good politician, and he's defending jobs in his district, and that's what he's supposed to do, and we respect him for it. We believe he's a good, smart, intelligent man, and we would do nothing differently in his place. So, again, we don't want this to be a big bait about Aries Orion. As John Lennon says, we want to give peace a chance, but all that we would say to Senator Shelby and to others uh, in Congress and at the agency is don't dismiss commercial. We need another plan just in case plan A doesn't work out. So regardless of where you stand, uh, whether Aries Orion is a good idea or you support direct or anything, we believe commercial is an important alternative to keep alive just so that we have a backup plan to keep Americans flying in space. And just to wrap up, and I know I'm over, uh, in terms of the difference between government and commercial, uh, this is an image uh, taken from Genesis 2. And that's our S-band antenna sticking out right there. And I missed when we put the Genesis 2 into the warhead uh, of, or what would be the warhead of the Nepra launch vehicle, and it was white uh, when I left launch base. And then here I am a couple months later looking at these images, and it's black. And I found out what happened at the launch base was that our engineers got concerned that what was a white antenna would create a reflection against the camera. So at the last moment, they covered the whole damn thing in duct tape. <laughs> and that's the difference going from government red tape to entrepreneurial duct tape. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Our next speaker is Dr. George F. Sowers. He's Vice President of Business Development for the United Launch Alliance, headquartered in Denver, Colorado. He is responsible for strategic planning, advanced technology development, advanced concept development, and new business acquisition. Before joining ULA, Dr. Sowers was Director of Business Development and Advanced Programs for Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company, space transportation line of business located in Denver, Colorado. Dr. Sowers previously served as Director of Mission Integration for the Atlas Launch Vehicle Program. Dr. Sowers also served as the Chief Systems Engineer and Director of the Systems Engineering and Integration Team for the Atlas V Development Program. Dr. Sowers began his career in the, in the aerospace industry with Martin Marietta in 1981 on the Titan Program as a flight uh, design engineer. Dr. Sowers received his Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from Georgia Tech in 1980 and obtained his Ph.D. in physics from the University of Colorado in 1988. George Sowers. All right, the first challenge here. And let's see here. Which one is it? Rocket science is easy, PowerPoints are hard. <coughs> is that you right there? Yep. 
All right, great. Um, I've learned that it's uh, always tough for an engineer and a scientist to follow a lawyer in a speech, you know, and it, hopefully uh, I won't put you to sleep here, but uh, thanks for the introduction, Patty, and uh, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be on this panel with some of my furry mammal friends. Um, you know, the, the standing joke is that the entrepreneurs are the fur furry mammals, and ULA with its uh, parentage of Lockheed and Boeing is the, uh, the lumbering dinosaur. But um, and, you know, I'll remind my friends that, uh, that you know, when dinosaurs and mammals coexisted, uh, the mammals were viewed as prey. <laughs> <laughs> um, since this is a, a commercial space panel, I'd like to reflect for a moment on the history of commercial space. Um, I like to think of the history in three broad phases, uh, which I call 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. Um, you know, my, our, my heritage companies, uh, Boeing and Lockheed, you know, we span all three phases. My personal career, and I date myself here, also spans all three phases. Uh, the commercial 1.0 began back in the, uh, in the late 80s. It was really driven by telecom. Uh, it's kind of existed all the way up until the present. Um, after grad school, I was on the commercial Titan program uh, at Mart Marietta. Uh, it was not a business success. We had four launches, uh, one failure exit and a write-off. Um, Commercial Atlas did marginally better, but it had three failures in the first seven launches, got sold to Mart Marietta and moved to Denver. Um, you know, one, one important point, since, the 19, since 1990, at the beginning of the Commercial Atlas program, 55% of Atlas launches have been commercial. I think that's a statistic that would surprise a lot of people. Um, commercial 2.0 I will characterize as an abject failure. Um, you know, it was driven by the big Leo constellation approach to broadband telecommunications. Uh, the Iridium and the Global Star constellation projects actually got deployed, but the companies uh, went bankrupt. Things got sold for pennies on the dollar. Teledesic Skybridge, Celestri never, never really got off the ground. I, I also was personally involved in that. I was the proposal manager for Lockheed for Teledesic. And I remember the trips up to, uh, to uh, Seattle on their beautiful place on Lake Washington. You know, we were going to darken the sky with satellites. There were 800 and something odd satellites that were going to get deployed. Um, but uh, ironically, the U.S. government benefited tremendously out of Commercial 2.0. Uh, they were able to uh, utilize the capabilities of Iridium and Global Star for pennies on the dollar. But more fundamentally, they got the EELV program out of it. Um, this was the time when Boeing and Lockheed invested a lot of money, counting on the, uh, the strong commercial market, uh, never materialized. The U.S. government got two EELV systems, which is, you know, the whole family of launch vehicles, both Atlas V and Delta IV. They got launch pads on both coasts for a mil mere $1 billion. Um, was not a business success for Lockheed and Boeing. They ended up writing off a lot of money. Um, so now I would say we're in the third phase of commercial, commercial 3.0. Um, it's, as Patty described, uh, it's driven by LEO destinations like the Bigelow Station, like the ISS. Um, and from an, a transportation standpoint, it's really the commercial delivery of crew, cargo, and propellant and other commodities uh, to LEO. So, you know, what are the lessons learned we can take out of the first couple of phases of commercialization to apply to commercial 3.0? Um, you know, a lot of lessons learned, um, a tremendous number of challenges. We know that the space transportation business uh, is tremendously capital intensive. Um, big rockets, which are required to deliver stuff to or orbit, uh, need big factories, they need big transportation systems, and they need big launch pads. That all costs a lot of money. Uh, the human capital side of it is also very important. Uh, you know, it's, it really still is rocket science. And even once you get those investments, both in human and, and, and physical capital done, you know, it's still a tremendously risky business. You know, was, uh, I was at the Augustine panel yesterday and was very interested to hear a lot of reliability numbers, loss of crew numbers being thrown around, you know, one in 2,000, one in 3,000. You know, those are great numbers for, for, you know, analyses, but the best the industry's ever done, and ULA represents that on both Delta II and Atlas, we're up to, you know, close to 90 consecutive successes. You know, it's best in the world. Uh, that gives you kind of a one in a hundred sort of reliability number in, in real life. So it's still a very risky business. 